Before I get into the lesson this morning, and as much as I haven't written a report to you, brethren, in some time, let me take just a moment to just tell you a little bit about some of the things that have happened in Rhode Island of late. We have a, a young man who is the most recent convert named Bob Antea, and it's a rather interesting story how we came upon him. For those of you who have memories like I don't have and like most of us don't have, but you read a name and you remember it, Gary Gifford is one of the brethren who had been with us from the very beginning. In fact, he became a Christian before we ever came up there. And he is an individual from whom we had to withdraw ourselves some time ago. Nonetheless, Gary is not one who doesn't know what's right. He does. And he's not one who became bitter because of the action that we had to take. He recognized it's what we had to do. Gary got a hold of his friend who lived two floors up from him and said, let's talk about the Bible. They got into discussions. I don't know that it started out, let's talk about the Bible. But they got into discussions about the Bible. And Gary taught him as far as Gary felt comfortable doing so and then got to the point he said, you're going to have to get in touch with people down at the congregation where I used to go. And uh, at first Bob was a little reluctant too because Gary had explained that we had withdrawn from Gary. Bob's feeling was, well, you know, if they've treated you that way, why should I go down there? Gary explained to him, no, that they did the right thing. And in fact, if you end up going down there, you're going to have to quit associating with me because they've withdrawn from me. It's a rather remarkable story, and I've had some occasion to talk with Gary a little bit since. Let me, before I get ahead of myself, Bob was baptized and became a Christian, and is growing, and I continue to study with him. And two or three weeks ago, Gary showed up at services again with the woman with whom he lives out of wedlock, but he did show up. So it's kind of an interesting turn of events. Well, Bob Antea has now led us to another young man, and I don't know where it'll go, but now I have a study with Bob and another young man, separate studies, on Thursdays. That's one encouraging thing that's happened lately. There's another thing that I'll tell you about briefly, and it'll kind of pertain to the lesson tonight. <clears throat> There's a congregation in North Attleboro in Massachusetts, just across the state line from Rhode Island, and it's a congregation of which we have been aware. We had one family come to us from there. I don't know what, four years ago maybe. Um, it's, a pro it's a congregation that has had its problems. And there's a man there who is or was an elder in the congregation there. And he, had, he and his wife have seven children. All of them, the youngest of them I suppose is 19, uh, no 16, 15 or 16. Uh, but one who is about 19 and married uh, and her husband really live clo much closer to us than they do to North Attleboro. They got so discouraged with the situation in North Attleboro. Her husband was a relatively new convert. He had just been baptized some two years ago and had not grown. I mean, had not grown. He, he, he was baptized and his spiritual development arrested there. And he got to the point where he really did not like going to church because it was just so discouraging to him. And it was rather interesting. One of the things that was so discouraging to them is all they heard was love. Here they're in a congregation where all anybody wants to talk about is love to the extent that her father, who did much of the preaching, who was the elder there, would get up and he would preach something that the Bible says, and people would say, you can't say that, somebody will take offense, and he'd have to get back in the pulpit and apologize for it. And his daughter lost a lot of respect for him. And his son-in-law became just totally discouraged with the whole thing. And so here you've got a congregation of people who are insisting, we've just got to talk about love and the people who are really concerned about going, doing right end up just dreading going to services because it's so discouraging. And there's a lot of infighting and a lot of bickering as they all talk about, we can't talk about what the Bible says. So she and her husband showed up at, at our place meeting with us one Sunday morning. And they've been there ever since. And her sister. And this morning, I didn't get to talk to him, but she had another sister there. And two other sisters have been there as well. That makes a total of one, two. Now, of these, three 
the original daughter and her husband and one sister have all indicated they wish to worship regularly with us, be counted as members there at North Providence. Uh, furthermore, her father and his wife, her mother, have, I suppose, the last two months, they've probably been with us half the time. And the other half the time, they've evidently been elsewhere, mostly back at North Attleboro. And that's another story. But that's kind of an interesting turn of events. And it really relates to some things that I want to talk about in the lesson this evening. And I, and I thought you, uh, this, this, this one young woman, she's 19, and she has more sense and more, she's, 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 a, she's a very special young lady. I, I can't say any more than that. I just, it's just amazing just to talk to her. She just got a lot of good sense, and a lot of strong convictions, and um, she's an amazing young lady. Well, anyway, what I want to talk tonight uh, to you about is the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? There are a lot of different perceptions of who Jesus is. Your knowledge about anything, I think, you can uh, say is a function of a couple of things. One, how much information you have. And two, how accurate is that information? Would you say that's probably pretty fair? What knowledge you have about who Jesus is is going to be a function of how much information you have and how accurate is that information. And uh, there are different perceptions of Jesus. In the religious world, certainly there are different perceptions. The Unitarians have their perception of Jesus. Uh, the uh, Muslims have a perception of Jesus, and interestingly enough, their perception of Jesus is that he taught the truth. Of course, what he taught was that uh, he is the one who is the culmination of, of all that was prophesied in the Old Testament, which really rules out a later prophet named Muhammad. But the Muslims, want, they say, well, Jesus taught the truth, but he wasn't the culmination of everything. We've got another prophet to come later. But that's one perception. Uh, some of the evangelicals and some of the people like in the congregation I was talking about a moment ago who see in Jesus kind of a Santa Claus figure with more spiritual overtones, just all love, not any negative about him. And, and I'll have more to say about that, some things that have been in the newspaper up there in Rhode Island in a few minutes. But with this concept, it's no wonder that uh, some poll, and I have the notes here, and I don't have where I got this, but some 70 to 80% of the population say that they believe there's a heaven, but only 10% say they believe there's a hell. And that reflects the picture that a lot of people have of God and of Jesus, that he's too loving to really uh, think that there could be a hell. There's a group that used to be on the radio in Rhode Island called the Church of Science, not Church of Scientology and not the, um, what's the other one? What's, what is it, Dad? Mary Baker, Glover, Patterson, Eddy. Christian Science. Not that. Some other group called the Church of Science. And they were on the radio one morning saying, Jesus said there can be no evil because God is all there is. Well, I won't even get into that. But obviously he didn't say that. But that's another perception of Jesus. Well, here are all these perceptions out there of Jesus. And so it's really worth asking the question, who is Jesus? And it's kind of like asking the question, and I'm going to use this illustration through the lesson tonight, who is Norman Schwarzkopf? And I use that because he's a, a man who kind of captured the imagination of the American public here uh, a couple of years ago uh, when, of course, there was the Persian Gulf War. And here was a man that nobody had ever heard of, and all of a sudden we all came to feel like we knew something about him. We learned a lot about him. And with him also, our knowledge of him is a function of two things. How much information we had about him and how accurate is that information? Well, let's take a look at the question, how much information do we have about Jesus? And the first answer to the question is, we have a lot of information about Jesus. Awful lot of information about Jesus. But if we're talking about number of sources of information, we really don't have a lot of information about Jesus. If you want to talk about numbers of sources besides the Bible, there are some mentionings of Jesus in secular history, but not many. I don't know that I have all of them here, but I think I do. I think I have all that there are. 
These are all the references to Jesus that I know of back about that time in secular sources. Josephus, Suetonius, Tacitus, and Pliny. And these are individuals, secular writers, historians, and such, who in one way or another mention Jesus. But if you were to try to find out who Jesus was from their writings, you really wouldn't find out much because they didn't have much to say about Jesus. Josephus' references to Jesus, as a matter of fact, are very much doubted. Many people think that they're really uh, not authentic, that it's stuff that has been interjected into the writings of jo Josephus at a later point. Uh, just briefly, I'll read to you a couple of the things that are said in Josephus about Jesus and that are, that are questioned, whether they're authentic or not. One, says, one statement from Josephus is, At that time lived Jesus, a wise man, if he may be called a man, for he performed many wonderful works. He was a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him many Jews and Gentiles. This was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the instigation of the chief men among us, had condemned him to the cross, they who before had conceived an affection for him did not cease to adhere to him. For on the third day he appeared to them alive again. The divine prophets, having foretold these and many other wonderful things concerning him, and the sect of the Christians, so called from him, subsists at this time. And the second statement from Josephus concerning Jesus is this. But this younger Anana, and an, an, how he's got it written here, I'm not sure I can pronounce. Ananus is the way he's got it written. Who took the high priesthood, was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. When therefore he thought he now had a proper opportunity to exercise his authority, he assembled the Sanhedrin and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some other. When he had formed an accusation against them, he delivered them to be stoned. And that's it. Now, you might say, you know, this sounds very sympathetic to believing in Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. And that's really one of the reasons that many people doubt that these are authentically, uh, authentic quotations from Josephus himself. They're not consistent with much of the rest of what Josephus says. And it's so, um, so much, so agreeable to uh, the idea that Jesus is the Christ that people think that, that it's very likely that this was interjected by somebody later on who wanted Josephus' statements to uh, vindicate the idea that Jesus is the Christ, which, of course, the Bible teaches and you and I believe. But my point is... In just a couple of minutes, I was able to read to you everything that Josephus says about it. Tacitus is a historian who mentions Jesus, but uh, really in passing, uh, talks about Christians and says they had their denomination from Christus, who in the reign of Tiburtius was put to death as a criminal by the procurator Pontius Pilate. Uh, this pernicious superstition, though checked for a while, broke out again and spread not only over Judea, the source of this evil, but reached the city also, uh, etc. And he says a few more things in connection with Rome and... Uh, persecution in Nero and whatnot, but it's just a paragraph more, and that's it. Suetonius is very brief in his reference to uh, the Christianity and whom he calls Crestus, because the Jews at Rome caused continuous disturbances at the instigation of Crestus. He expelled them from the city, and that's it. That's all you'll find about Jesus in Suetonius and Pliny. And Pliny's writings that had to do with Jesus are really writings about how to deal with believers in Christ, these Christians, and you're trying to get them to say, to renounce Christ, and, and if they won't, what do you do with them, and that kind of thing. And that's really all you would learn about Jesus there. So what I'm saying to you is, while, while there are a handful of sources, there are not many sources. And if you look at these various sources, you're really not going to learn anything about Jesus, anything extensive. Really, while there's a lot of information about Jesus, the only place that you're going to learn very much is in the Bible. That's really the information that we have. Now remember, we started out saying what you know about something is, is dependent on how much information you have and how accurate is that information. Well, there's a lot of information, but just here, really. And this is accurate. So you can know a lot about Jesus, but you see where I'm going with this already. The only way you can really know anything about Jesus is by going to this. That's really it. Let me put it this way. How much would you know about Norman Schwarzkopf? If there were no TV, no magazines, no newspapers, no radio, 
How much would you know about Norman Schwarzkopf? That's how much you know about Jesus without the Bible. Virtually nothing. Virtually nothing. Now let's talk about accuracy just for a moment. moment. Go back to Norman Schwarzkopf. Suppose there were radio, TV, papers, all of that, where you could get information, relatively accurate information. You could actually sit down and watch somebody, some one of these news media people interview Norman Schwarzkopf. And you could actually hear this taped interview and, or you could read it in print, and you could read what Norman Schwarzkopf himself said. But you didn't do that. You were an individual who didn't read the newspaper, and you didn't watch the interviews, and you didn't listen to the radio, and you didn't... Did he write a biography? Did he write a book? Everybody famous writes a book. He must have. I think he did. Maybe he didn't. Well, he will if he didn't. <laughs> Surely. And you didn't read any of that. But you would hear about him because people would talk about him. You know, I mean, I'm sure at work back here in the Persian Gulf War. I, how, how, how many workplaces did not the workers talk about Norman Schwarzkopf back here? So you'd have heard something. But if that was your only source of information, just what hearsay you picked up talking with acquaintances at work whose information about Norman Schwarzkopf is probably no more reliable than their information about anything else, and you didn't read any of the interviews or see any of the interviews, read anything that was written about what he himself had said, you just kind of picked it up hearsay along the way. How accurate would your information have been about Norman Schwarzkopf? How accurate a picture would you have? Well, you might have some general basic concepts about it. Some would be right, some would be wrong. My guess is if you then met the man and got to know him, you'd find out you really didn't know him very well at all on the basis of that. Now, that's kind of like the individual who doesn't bother to read the one source where there's a lot of information about Jesus and where it's written down what he himself said, but really he only knows about Jesus what, what he hears. He's heard somebody say this or that about Jesus. He's heard some religious figure say something about Jesus. His friends at work talk a little bit about their concepts of Jesus. And everybody says Jesus is love. It might have been God, who knows, but you don't get into that. You can see that your concept of Jesus wouldn't be real accurate. You couldn't put a lot of confidence. couldn't see it as real reliable. The Bible certainly is written by man, but it claims, of course, it was written by men who were guided by the Holy Spirit. That's better than a newspaper reporter who's telling you what he thinks of Norman Schwarzkopf, you see. So, then we look around us today. We've been really dealing with this issue of homosexuality in Rhode Island lately. There's a bill that keeps coming up every year, and it just recently came up again, where they're trying to pass a so-called gay rights legislation. And one of the things that I, I keep seeing is somebody writing in the newspaper all these people who are against homosexuality, they're just bigots and they claim to be Christians. If Jesus were here today, he would say we need to be more tolerant and accepting of one another. We need to love one another. As a matter of fact, the newspaper came out with a heading that said, The Bible on Homosexuality. And it had two columns, yes and no. The question, does the Bible condemn homosexuality? Two columns, yes and no. It was just outlandish. They listed... In the, in the column under no, uh, uh, under yes, the, the various passages and statements that, of course, would condemn homosexuality. Over here in the other column where they say, no, it doesn't condemn homosexuality, they had the most specious argumentation. And one of the things they said over here in this column that says, no, the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality is Jesus was mostly concerned with teaching love. And he never said anything about homosexuality. That was their concept. I happened to call. This was written by a guy at the Detroit Free Press in Detroit, Michigan, and it was picked up Knight Ritter Services and carried in the Providence Journal. I called him. I talked to him. And one of the things he had said was, the Bible never condemns lesbianism. And I was pointing out, I said, you got real problems with this column. And, and one of the things I mentioned to him, you just got basic facts wrong. You've got a lot of... But, but when I mentioned he just had some basic facts wrong, I'm like, what? And I said, well, you, you, Scott, you say the Bible never condemns lesbianism. It does. Romans 1.26. You know what he said? He said, what does it say? <laughs> he didn't know. But now you've got all these people reading this paper. He, he, he cited Romans 1.27 in his article. 
He didn't know what Romans 126 said. He interviewed a bunch of community, metropolitan community church people for his religious perspective. Now, this was a, this was a series that ran for days. Providence Journal condensed it into three days, but he told me when he wrote it, this thing ran for days. It's major research. You didn't know what Romans 126 said. Where did he get his picture of Jesus? Well, not from the Bible. Not from the Bible. So he could sit there and say, well, you know, basic, basically Jesus was all about love. And he doesn't know. You see, we have real problems when we start trying to decide what Jesus would do or would say or would think today if we don't really pick up our Bible and find out. So what I want to do the rest of the time that we have this evening is talk about what the Bible tells us about Jesus. Who is Jesus? And I'm not going to spend much time at all on the first two points. They're really not the point of my lesson this morning. They, 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 are, they are fundamental points. First one, he is alive. So it's not who was Jesus, it's who is Jesus. Yes, he was crucified, but he was raised from the dead. I'm not going to spend time with that this evening. Obviously, that's fundamental. That's why this all matters. But I'm not going to spend time with that. Second point, he is God. And I'm not going to spend time with that this evening. But let me go ahead and put them down here as we're talking about the question, who is Jesus? One, well, first of all, it's important to note that he is alive. And that's why it's important as to who he is. Secondly, that he is God. And in fact, proclaimed to be the Son of God, according to Romans 1 chapter and verse 4, by his resurrection. But I want to move on to the next point, and that is, he is compassionate. He is compassionate. A lot of people would... would be quick to accept that. The Bible shows him to be very compassionate. John, the 11th chapter, is the account of the death and resurrection of Lazarus. And of course, you recall that, in fact, Jesus had allowed Lazarus to die, had not gone earlier, that he might raise Lazarus from the dead and show the power of God and show himself to be who he claimed to be. But John, the 11th chapter, in verses 33 and following, he's already discussed with Lazarus' sister, Martha. He's already talked to her about what's going on. And now Mary, who strikes me as the quieter one of the two, and the, the kind of woman who is quiet, reserved, but she has a lot of feeling, and sometimes that's all pent up, and when it comes and breaks, it just breaks out like a dam breaking. And she comes to Jesus. Verse 32, Mary, therefore, when she came where Jesus was and saw him, fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, who came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have ye laid him? They say unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And then there's the passage in John, the 19th chapter, as Jesus is dying on the cross. Verse 26 and 27, his mother, Mary, is there. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her unto his own home. Here he is, dying on the cross, and he sees these two whom he loves, and his concern is for them. Compassion. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. In fact, a couple of passages in Hebrews we'll take a look at. I think also illustrate his compassion. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in verse 15. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but one that hath been tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He's the perfect one to look to. He can have compassion because he's been through what we go through, but successfully, without sin. 
And I will look at Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 17. Wherefore it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Compassion. And he is loving. Jesus talked a lot about love. And people are right when they say, well, the essence of Jesus' message is love. That's true. It certainly is. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, in verses 37 and following, he is asked, what is the great commandment? He says, this is the first and great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. And the second like unto it is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hangeth the law and the prophets. Essentially, he's saying, you take the whole of God's commands, his words, what... What, what these are really designed to do is teach you how to love, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what they're all about, love. John 15, verse 10, Jesus says some more about love. Here he says, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You remember the story of the rich young ruler? Mark's account is an interesting one to look at in connection with the things we're talking about this evening. As we ask this question, who is Jesus? And we talk about the fact that he is loving, or I could simply say he is love. You remember the rich young ruler is the one that Jesus said uh, when he was asked, what, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He said, keep the commandments. And the man says, which? And and Jesus lists them, and the man says, I've done all these, but lack I yet. Mark's account gives us a detail that will be helpful here. In Mark chapter 10, in verse 21, Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Now, this really leads right into the next point that I want to notice tonight. Jesus is demanding. And it's interesting that in this passage it becomes clear there's not a contradiction in understanding Jesus to both be loving and demanding. He is demanding. When he asked this, this young ruler to sell everything that the man had and give it to the poor, he did not suppose that he was asking something that would be easy for this man to do. Jesus wasn't caught by surprise when the man failed to do it and went away sorrowful. Jesus knew the man. He knew the man's heart. Remember Jesus said to him, one thing thou lackest. He said, there's something you don't have in your heart. The Lord was not first with this man and Jesus knew it. But Mark says... Looking upon him, Jesus loved him and demanded and said, sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. That's what will be necessary. Now that's interesting. And I think that's something that a lot of people fail to pick up on when they start talking about who Jesus is. They don't understand. Yes, he's loving. That's not one whit taking away from the idea that he's demanding. Well, let's go on and talk about some of the things that we see illustrating how demanding he was. Matthew, the 8th chapter, verse 21 and 22. Another disciple said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus saith unto him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Get your priorities straight. Let those who are spiritually dead take care of the worldly things. You come and follow me. That's demanding. Matthew, the 10th chapter, and verse 37, is where Jesus says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's demanding. Matthew, the 16th chapter, and verse 24, is where Jesus says, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Who is Jesus? He's the man that said these things. 
We've already talked about the rich young ruler. Think about Jesus' own life. He lived his life in submission to the Father. He said, I do not do my own will, I do the Father's will. He said, I speak not for myself, but that which is given me. Let's look at Philippians, the second chapter. And I want you to think about why it was necessary that Jesus do all of this. Look at Philippians, the second chapter. Why was it necessary that Jesus live this life of submission? Is it something in the nature of things, in the nature of the relationship between the one revealed to us as the Father and the one revealed to us as the Son? Or is that a role that was assumed by Jesus, a role of submission for some purpose? If it was assumed, what purpose? Philippians, the second chapter. Beginning in verse 5, as Paul writes to the brethren at Philippi, he says, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who existing in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. This is a role he assumed. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. He lowered himself into this role of one who is submissive to another and does not do what he himself would do, but whatever the Father gives him to do. That's what he does. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse 9, says he became, uh, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And let me turn there and read it. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse uh, 8 and 9. Though he was a son, yet learned obedience, learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became unto all them that obey him, the author of eternal salvation. What I suggest to you is, remember the passages we read where it made the point he's been tempted in all points as are we? He lived the life he did in part because that's the life that we have to live. And it was necessary for him to go through what we would have to go through that he would have walked in the shoes that we will be walking in. So that, well, as John the 12th chapter, John the 5th chapter, verse 28. John the 12th chapter. Well, let me think here. Where is this passage? John the 5th chapter is where it is. Verse 27. Let's start in verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, even, even, even so gave he to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Jesus, having gone through what we go through, having lived as a Son of Man, a human being, having been tempted in all points as we are, now that's the reason he has authority to execute judgment. He has been where we have to live. It was right that he have to live the life of submission, doing the will of another as we have to live. We're to look to him and walk in his footsteps. So I say all of that to say, he is demanding, well, the very life that he lives and what, or what that he lived on earth and what was demanded of him is a pattern for what he demands of us. Remember in John 15 and verse 10, he abides in the Father's love, doing what the Father tells him. We can abide in his love if we keep his commandments. What was demanded of him is a model for what he demands of us. He is demanding. He is the standard by which we'll be judged. And really, I'll just... Uh, well, uh, John 5, 28, he, uh, he's give, been given authority to execute judgment because he is a son of man, or I believe it was 5, 27. Let's also look at John 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my sayings hath one that judgeth him. The word that I spake. The same shall judge him in the last day. Well, let's move on. What else do we know about Jesus? 
let's just say he is penetrating in his judgment. What I want to say first is he judges motives. He judges motives. You know, that's something we have to be careful about. He judges motives. Let's look at some passages. Let's go to Matthew 5, 28, just to begin, where he is talking about what the Jews were accustomed to, what they had understood were the obligations for righteousness, and he says that our righteousness must exceed that. And he says in verse 27, You have heard that it was said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, that everyone that looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Throughout this section, Jesus talks about what you've heard, and Jesus goes to the heart, takes it one step further, and lays claim to the heart as his domain, as the region in which he has prerogative to judge. The heart. And then you look at some of the things that Jesus said from time to time. Luke, the 16th chapter, and verse 15. And just think about this. A man saying this of some others. Luke 16, 15, he said unto the Pharisees, Ye are they that justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. How would you, how comfortable would you feel standing before some group of people who are widely held as reputable as, as religious standards and to stand there and say, well, everybody thinks you're righteous, but God knows your hearts, implying your hearts aren't right. Well, let's look at another passage. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 5. He says of the Pharisees and the scribes, all their works they do to be seen of men. They're doing good things. They're giving alms. They're praying in the streets. And we'll get over that in Matthew the 6th chapter. But in here, here, uh, he just says, what they do, here's the reason. They do it to be seen of men. He's questioning the motives. He's not questioning. He's indicting the motives. In Matthew the 6th chapter, let's look at verse 2, verse 5, and verse 16 in Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 2. When therefore thou doest alms, sound not a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. That's why they do it. He accuses the motive. Verse 5. And when ye pray, ye shall not be as the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. That's the motive. Jesus indicts the motive. Verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, fast not as the hypocrites, or be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may be seen of men to fast. He indicts the motive. He says that's the motive. And he accuses on that basis. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 23, in the letter to the angel of the church at Thyatira, Revelation 2, verse 23, he says, I will kill her children, Jezebel's, with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts. And then back in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, let's look at verse 12. And I want to spend just a moment on this passage. It says... Remember, we're going to be judged by the word that Jesus spake. And here's what Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 12 says about this word, the word of God. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. Every now and then I get asked this question. When Paul talks about being sanctified whole and entire, what, what is it? Soul, uh, body, soul, spirit, soul, body, spirit. What order is it in? Dad, what order? What order is the statement in? Well, those three are all there. Soul, body, spirit. First Thessalonians 5. And I get asked, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? You've got the body and now the soul and the spirit. What's the difference between those two? And that's one of those questions when I see it coming. I... You know, I, 
Where's the door? <laughs> well, if somebody else got a question real quick, ask it before he finishes his. <laughs> That's tough. And maybe, maybe some of you have got that figured out, or maybe Dad's answered that. Maybe I need to come back and find out. Maybe that's something you can tell me. But this is one of those questions. That's a tough thing. And yet, that's the, that's the way that the point is made here is illustrated how sharp the sword of the Word of God, the sword which is the Word of God, is of both joints and marrow and quick to discern the thoughts, the thoughts, and intense of the heart. Now I want you to think about this. A moment ago I was saying, how would you feel about standing and accusing somebody's motives? And we really do. We need to be careful doing that. We can't just stand and accuse somebody's motives as if we can see into their heart like the Lord can. But Jesus did say, by, your, by their fruits ye shall know them, remember. Fruits indicates what's in the heart. Not by virtue of all the experience you've had and so forth and so on but by virtue of what the Word of God says. You see, the Word of God, what it says here about the Word of God, which we can use, the Word of God is quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. We can start dealing with problems and situations and sin and somebody's situation, and we can get into all of our experience, and we can get into a lot of psychobabble, and mix all of that in with the Word of God and try to kind of put it all together. And if we do that, all we do is take something that can cut a lot sharper than all of my experience can. We take something that really could go right to the heart. And we dull it to the point that it's no sharper than my own experience, which is not very sharp. Or my own wisdom, which is not very sharp. You see... Here's somebody and they've committed a sin. They've stolen something. They've committed fornication. The Word of God says the heart is wrong. Remember in Matthew the 15th chapter and verse 19, Jesus said, he talked about these things that come out of the heart and he mentioned a bunch of sins including thefts and fornication. Come out of the heart. So I might sit here and in all of my wisdom, I might debate the issue. Is there a problem in the heart or is there not? And so forth and so on. And get all of my experience brought to bear on the question and so forth. And I'm really trying to do something with my human perceptive perception and perspective that I can't do. But the Word of God can. Now, what we've said tonight about Jesus is a picture that's certainly not exhaustive. But it's a picture that is a little bit better balanced than I think the picture is that a lot of people have. These make it all important. He is compassionate. He is loving. But His love is demanding. He demands that we be loving, and we don't know how to be loving except by doing what He said. Think of it that way. He's the standard of judgment, and He is penetrating in His judgment. We're going to stand before Him in the day of judgment and He's going to know what's in our hearts. And sometimes we can confuse ourselves so that we don't even recognize what's in our hearts. And that's easy to do, you know. We can do that. We can spend enough time listening to this justification or that rationalization and convince ourselves of something. But He is penetrating in His judgment. He searches the reins and the hearts. So in conclusion... Just let's kind of take a look at our concept of Jesus. If one's concept of Jesus fails to include his demanding nature, then he doesn't have a clear picture of who Jesus is. If one's concept of Jesus is of one who accepts every form of religious expression, then he doesn't have a clear picture of whom, of who, of whom, of, he doesn't have a clear picture of Jesus. And if one's concept of Jesus is of one who is who uh, esteems all those who pass themselves off as sincere, as truly being sincere. Remember when he said, Hear they that justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knoweth the heart, and that which is exalted among, ben, among men is an abomination in the sight of God. There are a lot of people whom I may think are sincere, but because they look sincere, because they seem sincere to me, doesn't mean they are sincere. And if my assumption is that everybody that I think is sincere, well, Jesus is just going to get right in line and say, okay, oh, yep. Then I don't have a clear picture of Jesus. 
because his judgment is penetrating. If your concept of Jesus or if one's concept of Jesus is that uh, he'll let everything slide in the day of judgment, then he doesn't have a clear picture of who Jesus is. And if one thinks that he knows something about Jesus, but it's not what's in the Bible, he just doesn't have a clear picture of Jesus. Remember what you know is a function of how much information you have and how accurate that information is. This is the accurate information. There's not any other accurate information. How often have you talked with somebody? This has happened to me. Has this happened to you? You talk with somebody. And they claim to be a Christian. They claim to follow the Bible. And you get to a passage and they say, well, I just can't accept that passage. I, I had somebody say this to me. I just can't accept that passage because that's not the kind of Jesus I believe in. Jesus is not some malleable figure where it's just kind of a, a name and you can attach it to whatever concept you want. Jesus is somebody real. He really is alive and he really is God and these are his characteristics. What we read in the Bible is what we know about Jesus. Well, I think probably all of this is, is, is uh, old hat. I, to the, I think we know all of this. But I think it's important to go back and stress these things I think maybe this kind of an approach is one that we can use with people when we start talking with people and they want to say, well, Jesus is this and Jesus is that.